Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about factor markets. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review Booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. Now, factor markets are like any other market where buyers and sellers come together to exchange something. In previous units, you learned about product markets where goods and services were being purchased and sold. Here, we have factors of production or resources that are being bought and sold. In factor markets, businesses are going to purchase resources from households. That means the suppliers and the demanders within the factor markets are different from suppliers and demanders in the product markets. In factor markets, the demand curve is comprised of businesses demanding resources. And those resources are supplied by households within the market. In macroeconomics, you see that illustrated with the circular flow diagram of the economy. And when it comes to the resources that are being purchased within factor markets, we have three productive resources that we focus on. First productive resource we're going to talk about is land. And monetary payments for land are called rent. Our second resource is labor, and payments for labor are called wages. Finally, we have physical capital. Businesses usually have to take out loans in order to pay for physical capital. And so payments for physical capital are called interest. Now in AP microeconomics, the resource we focus on most is labor. And with that, we focus on wages as the payment for that labor. And so labor is going to be our examples for this video moving forward. But be aware that all of these examples could apply equally to land and physical capital purchases. Now, when it comes to understanding labor markets, it's important for us to remember the production function that we learned back in unit three. Remember a production function shows us all the different quantities of labor that can be hired by a particular firm and the amount of physical product that can be created by those workers. Here we have the quantity of labor in this table along with the marginal product, which is the change in total physical product with each worker hired. And remember, thanks to the law of diminishing marginal returns, the marginal product curve is going to increase at first due to specialization, and then marginal product is going to decrease as more workers are hired because of diminishing marginal returns. Eventually, marginal product becomes negative because of negative returns. And if we take the wage that these workers are being paid and divide by the marginal product of these workers, it gives us the marginal cost of labor. And if labor is the only variable output for this firm, that marginal cost of labor will be the firm's marginal cost curve. It's a flipped upside down version of the marginal product curve. When marginal product is rising, marginal cost is decreasing. And when marginal product is decreasing, marginal cost is rising. Now, in order to understand the demand for labor, we have to understand the marginal revenue product of labor. In order to find the marginal revenue product, we are going to take the marginal product of each worker hired and times it by the marginal revenue of the units produced. Here we have the marginal revenue being $10 for each unit. That means this firm is selling their products in a perfectly competitive market because the price doesn't change as they produce more units of output. So the marginal product of that first worker is $9 times the $10 of marginal revenue gives us $90 worth of marginal revenue product for that first worker. The second worker has $130 of marginal product. It's the 13 marginal product times the $10 of marginal revenue. The third worker has $100 worth of marginal product. And if we keep on going, multiplying the marginal product by the marginal revenue, we have those marginal products for each additional worker. Now the marginal revenue product for all of these quantities of workers is the demand for this firm's labor. And that's because the marginal revenue product is the maximum a firm would be willing to pay for a particular quantity of workers. If our wage was $50 and this firm was trying to decide how many workers it would hire, the third worker has a marginal revenue product of $100. That means it increases revenue by $100. And that is much more than the $50 this worker costs. And so profit would increase by $50 for hiring this worker. So this worker would be hired. That fourth worker produces $70 worth of marginal revenue product, and that means the profit will increase by $20 by hiring this worker, and so this worker would also be hired. That fifth worker, on the other hand, only increases revenue by $40, and so hiring that worker would actually decrease economic profit by $10. So the profit maximizing quantity of workers hired by this firm will be four workers. Because just like everything else in this class, Benefit maximization occurs when you do something as long as the marginal benefit, in this case, the marginal revenue product, is greater than or equal to the marginal cost. In this case, that marginal cost is the wage. And so that marginal revenue product graphed with the quantity of workers hired is the demand for labor for this firm. 
Now you could see a question that refers to the value of the marginal product. The value of the marginal product is a slightly different formula. It's the price of the product times the marginal product. But most of the time, the value of the marginal product and the marginal revenue product are going to be equal because most of the time, the firm is going to be selling into a perfectly competitive product market where prices and marginal revenue are equal. So on this chart, the marginal revenue is the price because this firm is selling in a perfectly competitive market. When it comes to graphing out the demand for labor for an entire market, we're going to have the quantity on the x-axis and the wage on that y-axis because the wage is the price of labor. The demand for labor is downward sloping because there is an inverse relationship between the wage and the quantity of workers that businesses hire. At high wages, businesses hire few workers, and at lower wages, businesses hire more workers. And if the wage increases, the quantity of workers hired will decrease. And that demand curve we see there is the sum of every firm's marginal revenue product curve, at least the downward sloping portion. So you should know that that demand curve from the market is the sum of every firm's marginal revenue product curve. And remember, businesses within this market are the demanders not the suppliers like you've seen in previous units. That labor demand curve will shift with anything that will change the marginal revenue product for these workers. It could be the price of the actual product, the demand for the product itself, the productivity of the workers because more productive workers have a higher marginal revenue product. We could also have the price of a substitute resource like machines that can replace workers. If there's an increase in the demand for these workers, we're going to see a rightward shift just like we've seen with other demand curves. And if there's a decrease in the demand for labor, we're going to see a leftward shift of that demand curve. And remember that downward sloping demand curve is the marginal revenue product of the workers hired by these firms. Now the demand for labor is often referred to as a derived demand. That means the demand for the resource comes from the demand of the product itself. So if there's an increase in the demand for houses, there will be an increase in the demand for carpenters. And if there's an increase in the demand for medical care because our population is aging, there will be an increase in the demand for nurses as well. And when there is a decrease in the demand for cars, we should see a decrease in the demand for auto workers. And so the demand for labor in part is derived from the demand for the product itself. Next, we're going to talk about the supply of labor. The supply of labor is still going to have the wage on that y-axis and the quantity on the x-axis. And when we graph in the supply of labor, it's going to be an upward sloping curve, just like most supply curves within this class. And that's because there's a direct relationship between the wage and the quantity of workers that are willing and able to work. At low wages, we have a low quantity of workers supplied and when wages rise, more workers are willing to work. But if that wage decreases again, the quantity of workers supplied will also decrease. And remember, the households are the suppliers of labor. That means average everyday consumers are likely to be in that supply curve. And that's different from other supply curves where we have mostly been the demand curve. And remember that supply curve is the number of workers that are willing and able to work at each possible wage. One key term you could see in regards to the buying and selling of resources is economic rent. Economic rent is sort of like economic profit or producer or consumer surplus that you've already learned. Essentially, it's any amount above the minimum needed to bring a resource into use. Essentially, it is the wage minus the opportunity cost of a particular worker. If a teacher earning $50,000 quits their job, losing that $50,000 to become a rock star earning a million dollars a year, that means this former teacher will have $950,000 worth of economic rent. So it's essentially any amount above the opportunity cost for that worker because the teacher would need more than the $50,000 in order to quit teaching and become that rock star. So getting back to our supply of labor, we need to remember that the labor supply curve can also shift just like our demand for labor can. The number of workers within a labor market, the availability of workers within a market, the population's age as far as whether they're close to retirement or far away from retirement, the value workers place on leisure, and skill requirements of a job will impact the quantity of workers that are available at each particular wage. If there's an increase in the number of workers willing and able to work, that will shift our supply to the right. And if there's a decrease in the number of workers willing and able to work, it will shift our supply curve to the left. When we put our supply for labor and demand for labor together on the same graph, it gives us our equilibrium wage found at the intersection between the two curves. Our equilibrium quantity is down below on the x-axis 
and the equilibrium wage is on the y-axis. And just like with other markets, equilibrium is determined through interaction between the supply curve and the demand curve. And that establishes the wage that most workers are going to be paid within this market. And this labor market functions just like product markets you learned about in unit two. A little note that you need to be aware of, when we are at equilibrium, the quantity of workers that businesses wanna hire at that wage equals the quantity of workers willing to work at that wage. So there is no unemployment when we are at equilibrium. The quantities of workers to the right of our equilibrium quantity wanted higher wages than our equilibrium wage in order for them to work. And the businesses were only willing to hire those workers for a lower wage than the equilibrium. And as a result, those workers are not considered unemployed. Next, we're going to briefly look at the impact of a minimum wage on a competitive labor market like this. A minimum wage is a price floor for a wage. That means if it's effective or binding, it will go above the equilibrium wage there. And when we are at a higher than equilibrium wage, the quantity demanded of workers hired by businesses will be less than the equilibrium quantity. And the quantity of workers willing to work at that higher wage will be higher than the equilibrium. The gap between that quantity supplied and quantity demanded are unemployed workers. So minimum wage in a competitive labor market could cause some levels of unemployment, but the amount of the unemployment will be impacted by the elasticity of the supply and demand curves for labor. And that elasticity will also impact the total wages earned by the workers. But as you're going to learn later on in this unit, that might not be true when it comes to monopsonies, which is a non-competitive labor market. Next, let's take a look at changes within the labor market. If we have shifts of either curve, it's going to shift our equilibrium quantity and wage. If businesses begin to demand more workers, that will shift our demand curve to the right, increasing our equilibrium wage and quantity of workers hired. Next, let's take a look at some examples of changes within the labor market. Let's say that the pandemic that we've all been living through causes workers to value leisure more. What would that do to the supply or the demand curve? Well, an increase in the value of leisure is going to make workers less willing and able to work at each wage. That will shift our supply of labor to the left, and as a result, we should see an increase in wages and decrease in the equilibrium quantity of workers hired. If instead we saw the price of the product increase, that would increase the marginal revenue product of all the workers within this market, and that would mean that our demand curve shifts to the right, because the demand is the marginal revenue product for every firm added together. The increase in demand is going to increase our equilibrium wage and increase the equilibrium quantity of workers hired. If automation technology that replaces workers with machines gets more cheap, then labor is going to appear relatively more expensive. That will decrease the demand for workers and with that, decrease the wage and equilibrium quantity of workers hired. And a little side note, because we are still at equilibrium, just a new equilibrium, there will not be any unemployment at this new equilibrium quantity because the workers who are no longer being hired don't want to work at the lower wage, given the upward sloping supply curve. Finally, for our last example, if there's an increase in the working age population, that's going to increase the supply of workers within this market. And with that, we are going to see a decrease in the wage and increase in the equilibrium quantity of workers hired. And there you have it. That is your introduction to factor markets. You're going to learn about perfectly competitive firms within these markets, and you're going to learn about monopsonies later on as well. If after watching this video, you still need some more help, head over to reviewecon.com and pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see y'all next time.